Well, welcome to All Space Considered, everybody. Um, it is normally on the third Thursday of every month, and that's not what today is, of course, if you've, as you've noticed. Um, we moved the show because we have a special guest tonight, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but we are going to stream it to YouTube on the third Thursday. So audience out there, it's, it's really not happening tonight. It's happening, um, yeah, anyway, Thursday, October 5th, as you see. Anyway, tonight we are having Jared with an Out to Launch segment. We haven't talked about what's been launching recently, and we decided to let you go first. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Finally, I get to go first. No, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Um, and then the return of Osiris Rex, the return of Rex. Um, a brief little news story for you. We'll keep, uh, keep it to the headlines. Um, because we have a very special guest, Paul Kerno from Adelaide Planetarium, uh, who's going to talk about Aboriginal skies. And I'll introduce him a little bit more after we take care of our, our first couple of segments. Um, so we're very excited to have him talk tonight. Um, but before that, um, Ella, are you in the audience? There you are. Um, I wanted to have Ella talk a little bit about our foundation, just if you could just stand up for a second. Yeah, you said you would. Ella, 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 Ella. 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 <laughs> She has her cowbell. <laughs> My name is Ella. I'm the communications coordinator for Griffith Observatory Foundation. Uh, the foundation is Griffith Observatory's exclusive nonprofit funder. Uh, we uh, offer a membership program, and uh, if any of you are interested in becoming a member, you can visit the, uh, our website or talk to me. Hooray! <laughs> Yay. Yay. Um, thank you, Ella. Um, and in addition, our foundation does amazing things like she said, clips trips. And I am lucky enough to get to lead the trip that's going to Texas. Now, you might be thinking eclipse. That's October 14th, isn't it? Well, yes, but that's not the total solar eclipse. That eclipse is an annular solar eclipse. So even if you're in the path of annularity, as it's called, you're not going to see that spectacular total solar eclipse. It's cool. You got a ring of fire. It's worth it if you can go travel for it and you have time but the one you really want to see is april 8th of next year and if you're in the path of totality it's kind of it, it's like your life before you saw an eclipse and your life after you saw the eclipse it really is it's i was trying to describe it like if you've jumped into an ice cold um lake if you've ever been out camping early summer before the lakes warm up and you know what that plunge feels like well if you've never done that the equivalent of seeing a partial solar eclipse is like putting your finger into that cold water. And you're like, yeah, that's cold, versus diving into the cold water and getting the full plunge. So it's a completely different experience. And you can still come join us. You can join our own director, Dr. Krupp, and you can go to Mexico. Imagine that, getting to experience an eclipse there in Mexico with him. Or you can join me in Texas. Um, the Texas trip's a little shorter. But go to our website, check them out. They're both still available, and we're going to have a lot of fun for that eclipse. So if you haven't seen one, please do. Well, Jared, um, let's turn to Al to launch finally. Let's, yes. uh, do you want to take the remote? Oh, yeah, I'll take the remote. Awesome. Wow, this is amazing. So uh, <laughs> I'm just so not used to working this early during All Space Considered. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to go over to Russia. We, we was going to start off our lunar double feature that we've had since uh, last time we had All Space Considered mm -hmm. in August. This is their Luna 25 probe, which was going to land on the surface of the moon in late August and actually bring back a sample of the moon to us. Um, but unfortunately, on August 19th, it, it, it did burn its engine, but it burned its engine way too long and it ended up doing this to the moon so yes so that is the splat uh from from it hitting the moon as it did so unfortunately it did not successfully land on the moon um it did perform a successful maneuver that we call litho breaking um <laughs> and we think it litho breaked at about a, roughly about somewhere about a mile per second um, there, but yes, uh, unfortunately, they did not have a successful mission there. Now, for folks that didn't get that joke, the lithosphere is the mm -hmm. solid surface. surface yeah. Yes. So we call it litho breaking. Yeah. Uh, if you land in the uh, ocean too hard, we call that uh, aqua breaking. Oh. So, okay. as well. So, uh, but speaking of successes, there actually was a success. Uh, it seems that the moon is just so hot right now. Everybody wants to go there. Uh, but Chandrayaan-3, uh, very interesting mission. India has big space ambitions, and it seems that they always do great. And they successfully landed Chandrayaan-3 on the surface of the moon. So, excellent. Woohoo! <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Big moment for them. 
So Chandrayaan-3, this is a view from the cameras that were on board as it was coming down to the lunar surface, uh, actually is the first vehicle to successfully land near the south pole of the moon. Uh, so it was doing analysis of the surface there. There is its rover, Pragyan, uh, which is going out to the surface. I love it. It's just this little thing about the size of a microwave. And uh, it was moving around, kind of taking up up close uh, measurements of what the surface is made out of because they want to see if it is different to the surface that, uh, say, is near the equator of the moon in there and see if we can find water in the lunar surface as well. Um, now, uh, uh, Pragnion here actually had cameras on board, so this is it, and uh, also the lander Vikram did the first ever hop on the moon as well. So this is a view of it taking off, uh, getting a couple feet in the air, moving a couple feet, and then coming right back down on the lunar surface there. It's the first time they've had a vehicle leave the surface of the moon and then return to the surface of the moon. So, uh, so a really big, uh, big achievement there uh, for them. And then as uh, many of us saw <laughs> earlier on, which is that the Falcon 9 from SpaceX continues to add on to its record. It's got 67 launches and counting so far this year. Um, if we want to throw Falcon heavies into the mix, we got 70 and counting, and there's still somewhere about 25 to 30 to go uh, for the rest now, of Now is that year. a th plus three for the one Falcon heavy launch? So we would consider, <laughs> so I wish we could, but no, um, we, we don't do that. Okay. And no matter how much Elon tweets at us, we don't do that. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, very exciting. So they, they're they getting very close to possibly doing 100 flights this year, and that would be uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, they set the record for a single rocket in, in a year, 61 launches last year, so they've already went past that um, in September. So uh, absolutely stunning with that there. And of course, we want to let you know about Vandenberg Space Force Base here in the Southern California area. Here are all launches with an orbital velocity through October of 2023. Uh, we actually have a real time and date for one coming up. Usually they're very much um, don't know, but uh, there's going to be a Starlink launch at around 5.37, 17.37 on this Sunday, October 8th, 2023. Uh, so go take a look at it. However, I do recommend uh, Sarah, not you, um, <laughs> but a different Sarah, uh, a, a radar sat will be launching two satellites uh, sometime this October. And of course, we've got the three stars there because of the triple sonic boom, because that will be a return to launch site landing. So if you go and you actually watch the launch, you will be able to see the Falcon 9 go up. And then just about eight minutes later, you will see the booster that you saw go up come right back down right in front of you. And uh, if you can, go see it. It is absolutely spectacular. Um, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, another Starlink uh, expected there. And then a, uh, <laughs> I love this payload name, Tantrum, um, from Alpha, their Firefly rocket, which uh, if you just saw that rocket launch a couple weeks ago at sunset, that was a Firefly Alpha. Um, so they are on the, they are kicking off and making things happen with that there. And that's a nice little uh, rideshare mission that they're gonna be doing there. Uh, and I do wanna talk a little bit about one of my favorite rockets, um, which you may have seen it before. It starred in this movie, uh, Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Oh, there it is, right there. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so- th It's family. The, the re yeah, it is family, <laughs> family. So uh, the reason this is one of my favorite rockets Maybe you can figure it out. Take a look. Is there anything peculiar here? And I think I'm going to need you again, Sarah, yeah. to help me out <laughs> with these videos here. They're very powerful today. So let's see it. OK, it looks normal so far. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, I'm trying to track it a little yeah. bit there, and it's looking a little, huh, it's looking looking a little off there. Now, why would that rocket be so off like that? Yeah, huh, it's a little wonder, strange looking. I wonder why. I can't imagine why. Oh, wait, I can, because it has one solid rocket booster strapped to its side, not two. So this Atlas V 
has one solid on it, it's, and the Atlas V's RD180 main engine there is so potent that it can handle what we call asymmetrical thrust. You can literally stick a powerful solid rocket booster on the side of it, just one of them pushing that way, and the engine will be able to compensate for that. As so. long as you steer into the skid, you're all right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, don't forget, you know, uh, you know, counter steer with it correctly, yeah. uh, and uh, pull the handbrake a little bit, too, if you have to. So. <laughs> Uh, and, and it buried the throttle, as you're seeing right here, too, uh, with this, this gorgeous launch. Now, this is a nice launch, but this isn't new. This didn't happen last month. No, 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 before. this didn't. Uh, I, th I just thought it would be uh, really cool to, to show it. But also, there's a, a purpose for it. There is? As well. Yeah. Well, what launch is this? This is the launch of Osiris Rex oh. back in 2016. <laughs> okay. So this was a, you know seven years ago when it did the power slide yeah. right off of the pad. And th that's the last time they've launched this configuration of the Atlas V. Isn't they've it? actually launched another one, another one in this other? configuration, okay. and they even did one with their five meter payload fairing as well. So they're oh. bigger payload fairing. So that one looked even wronger. Even, even <laughs> wronger. Even wronger. Well, the mission he's talking about is indeed the OSIRIS-REx mission, which was a mission to a nearby Earth asteroid, an asteroid that comes very close to Earth. So let me give you a few facts about it. Um, it did launch September 8th, 2016, so quite a long time ago. And um, as you can see here, how tall is asteroid Bennu? That was its target. It's about 50 meters across which is big, but not that big. So, you know, it's, it's relatively small. So as you can see here, the journey of OSIRIS-REx. This is the video they published, and indeed these little stutters are how they made it. But the outbound cruise took a long time, 712 days. And you'll notice it looks like it's getting close, and then finally, Bennu acquisition and approach. It actually had to use a boost from Earth. Earth had to give it a little gravity boost in order to get it there. So. Um, not the easiest. Now we're actually seeing some of the, the future stuff here that we're going to talk about. Reconnaissance, begin sample collection, interesting, backup operations, and then, as you'll notice here, it, it begin the return cruise. So something's going to come back to Earth, and you'll notice a little, you know, it leaves the asteroid, <laughs> and it's going to come back to Earth, and sample return to Earth. This was done before the mission. So did it work? Let's take a look. Um, this is the very first picture that OSIRIS-REx took of asteroid Bennu as, it's, as it was on the way there. So it took a while to get there, a couple years. Um, finally saw it, acquired it, and that was on its own again. So good fun. Um, and finally it did get to Bennu, and this is what it saw when it got there. Now this mission is to get a sample of this near-Earth asteroid. This asteroid could hit Earth. It has a one in... I don't know how many hundreds of thousands chance of hitting us, not going to do it in the near future, but it could. So we want to know what's this thing made of? What's it look like? How could we stop it if it were going to hit us? And also, we were hoping these were primordial materials from the solar system, early, early stuff that didn't, wasn't transformed by being on the surface of a planet for a long time. Now, um, turns out the materials that make up Bennu it ends up being clay materials, and they were altered by flowing water. We, we knew this ahead of time, so a, a little bit weird. This probably was on a much bigger object that was destroyed and then reformed in its current orbit where it is now. So interesting object to go study, but where do you get a sample on this? this there's not a nice sandy beach here that you can go down and grab stuff. There's big boulders everywhere. So, Sarah, what did they have to do? Oh, hey, so yeah, this is... It's described as being a rubble pile in space. You can see that there are light boulders and dark boulders. The dark boulders, they tend to be more, sorry, less dense. The lighter boulders tend to be more dense. And that creates a whole fun architecture with inside the asteroid. So we've got, uh, I believe it should rotate for us. So you get the full experience of asteroid Bennu. Um, and these, ro these rocks, these boulders, they're the size of cars. And so you can see that there's not a whole lot of clear space. So it took several orbits for OSIRIS-REx to map the surface and look for patches that we hoped would be really nice, soft, small material, not big boulders, because it's a small craft to capture a small amount of really dust and sand. And so we picked Nightingale in the top corner there. And 
This is a mission where the craft is going to touch the asteroid. So you've got a tiny craft in orbit around a tiny asteroid. You need to map the gravity of that asteroid. So it, when we got there and found these really weird distributions of dark, really light, de less dense material, and really, uh, really, 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 really dense material, they discovered that there were some asymmetries in the gravitational field of Bennu. And so they had to spend several, several months orbiting it to map that. Luckily, there was some de debris kicked off the surface of the asteroid, and we could watch little grains of asteroid fall back and help us map the gravity. Okay, short story long, we did it. <laughs> yeah. In Nightingale, little patch of dust, Osiris Rex tapped down activated gas canisters and pulled up samples of mm -hmm. Bennu. Yeah, pulled up samples of Bennu. <laughs> and as you saw in, in the opening video we ran, um, the simulations, where they thought they'd go down, touch down, they'd run the gas, they'd pull in the dust and some samples, and it would all go in very orderly. But instead, <laughs> this is what happened. Let's rerun it, because it's just too spectacular. Um, the, the gas sampling part ran, everything went as it should, but instead, <laughs> Bennu was a lot less compacted than we thought. Everything was very loosely bound, um, so that action really flung stuff everywhere which was pretty neat. Um, anyway, fast forward, let's go on the long journey where the capsule is sent back to Earth. And this is the view of the sample return being sent down to Earth. So the spacecraft is like, see ya, heading it down there. And this is the view after it came and hit the Earth. So this happened just, what was it, a couple weeks ago? 24th. This point, the 24th. Um, so the sample return came down, it got blackened Indeed, by traveling through the Earth's atmosphere, it experienced over 30 Gs. So that's 30 times the gravity we experience here on Earth. It was 32, I think. Um, the external part got incredibly hot, but the sample deep down inside is safe. Um, you can see that cover in there. Um, that heat shield kept everything safe. And then that sample head down below in the capture mechanism sealed the material down in there. Well, things haven't gone quite as smoothly as they thought they would, but for good reason. There is so much material in this. Um, due to all that material that went flying up, when they opened up just the cover, they found asteroid material that's down inside there, which is, that's kind of crazy that they're finding asteroid material. So they're gathering all that little bits of dust. I think you can see that black material that's under that cover. They're gathering all of that because it's all valuable for science. So they thought they'd have more than they they, they do now, they thought they'd be getting samples, but we're waiting, they're, they're just being extremely careful about it. But this material gets us a, is the largest sample return we've ever gotten from an asteroid. It was less than a gram that was recovered. It was like a, a milligram or a microgram, something like that, that, that was that the Japanese got with Hayabusa from Itakawa, I think was the asteroid. Um, so I can't wait to find what, what they're gonna learn about this. It's, re it's really, really amazing stuff. So. We wait and see, but a huge, huge success. Like we said, it was seven years in the making. Um, so for this mission to succeed this way, and it's a relatively low cost mission. So a uh, big success to NASA and can't wait to hear more. <laughs> so, well, now um, we're gonna turn to our very special guest tonight, everybody. So why don't we swap over? I'd like to welcome to All Space Considered, Dr. Jim Al-Khalili from University of Surrey. Um, he's on our program today. Uh, he wrote a book called The Joy of Science, and that's so much akin to what we do here at Griffith Observatory. Um, I thought, I want to talk to Jim and see if we can get him here in person. Now, unfortunately, that didn't quite work out, but I'm thrilled to be able to do a virtual chit-chat with you here. Now, over the weekend, we did briefly talk at the Eclipse, and we, we talked about your book a little bit, and uh, the Eclipse was a great example of um, us bringing the public together and uh, showing off a great phenomenon. And uh, it was a great reason to chat. Well, I have a little bit more time now to talk to you about this. What sort of other physics um, items or physics experiments do you encourage people to do with their family? Is there anything they can do together um, besides eclipses to enjoy <laughs> science? <laughs> and, uh, well, we don't have another one for a while, so. Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be chatting to you, David, and it's a shame we couldn't actually, as you say, meet face to face. But here I am in San Francisco, not too far away from you. Um, yes, I think um, 
people tend to when you talk to people and you inspire them and explain something about science that they find fascinating very often it's oh if only i was taught that at school if only i had a teacher that you know and equally those people who end up going into science as a, as a career or using science in in their work in some way very often they'll say they were inspired by a particular teacher so i think and exploring being curious about the world doing experiments and there are lots of Lots of books out there that help, you know, parents, you know, when kids are off on vacation and they're trying to sort of, you know, how do you fill up their time? There are lots of sort of kitchen tabletop experiments that people can do yeah. that, that are very simple. Yeah, I think about you can take a comb and rub it in your hair and you can yeah. you know, become yeah. a waterbender all of a sudden. And, and it's, you know, kids are naturally curious about the world. We often say that scientists are just children who've never grown up because we never stop asking the why question. So it's actually not difficult to, to, to in, in, you know, sort of inspire kids or get them interested. Very often, sadly, it's, it's you know, the parents who probably feel um, less confident about explaining the science. And so, you know, they sort of pull away from it. But there's joy in even the simplest of demonstrations that that, that children will find uh, exciting, and adults, in fact, as well. So I'm sure there are many demos you have at the Griffiths Observatory that just gets across simple ideas behind which are sort of some pr profound understanding of of our universe. How do you see your book fitting in um, with bringing science literacy to the public? Because that's really what I've been on a mission to do to try and make people understand understand science a little bit better. Yeah, I, it's so important. I mean, it's it's a bit of a departure for, for me from my previous books, which have been more sort of traditional popular science, explaining, you know, quantum physics or astronomy or, or the history of science. This one was really about trying to get across how important it is that as a society, as a modern society, a democratic society, we 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 have a better understanding of how science works for various reasons, you know, uh, in 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 part because of course it empowers us you know we need to know reliable scientific explanations of you know why why wear a face mask or why um you know why floss your teeth or why recycle your garbage or, or you know what's happening with the climate i think it's empowering to have a better understanding of science but also i i get across the uh, the uh, you know how we do science the science isn't a collection of facts science is a process uh, and, and as good scientists, if we do it properly, we're, we're trained to examine our biases, uh, 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 be prepared to change our minds in the light of new evidence, be curious. So all those things that a scientist does, I feel that wider society could benefit from. We don't all have to be experts in, in cosmology or quantum physics, but I think thinking rationally about the world and viewing the world rationally is important. Apart from all the fact that it is just joyful, to 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 appreciate the world from through a scientific lens. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, here at Griffith Observatory, our mission, in fact, is not to teach people the science, but to inspire them to observe and ponder the universe. So when they come to our observatory, they're they're here. We let them experience it as they will. Mm -hmm. and next thing they know, they're learning some science. They don't even know they're doing it. Now, I find your work. Is, is done in a similar fashion that you tend to start explaining things and you do it through, again, the joy of the experience. Are there any examples you have of, of things you can use to teach science where people don't really know they're learning it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first, you're right. I should say that, uh, you know, I don't communicate science through writing and broadcasting because I feel altruistically that I need to educate the, the, the public. I do it because I'm passionate about science. I d derive enjoyment from seeing you know the light bulb go on over somebody someone's head as they understand something um so i'm passionate about it i explain it and exactly as you say the way you do things at the griffiths observatory is is very similar you know we we show how passionate we are and how wonderful uh, 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 the world of science is and people will be you know we're not ramming it down their throats people will themselves be inspired the example i use in the book uh, is in fact the rainbow uh, I know many people of science writers have written about this. Carl Sagan famously wrote about the rainbow. But my point there is that we can all appreciate the beauty of a rainbow. And I think there's some lovely parallels here with the eclipse over the weekend. Again, it's something we can all appreciate. But having a scientific understanding of it adds to the wonder, adds to the awe and the, and the enjoyment. 
looking at a rainbow. So I explained that, for example, no two people see the same rainbow when you look up into the sky because it's particular droplets of water that will bend the different colored light into your eyes and your eyes alone. So, you know, it, without getting into all sort of the details about refraction and, and total reflection, understanding something about rainbows, the fact that a rainbow isn't really an arc, it's just that's just because it's cut off by the ground. If you were to able to see a rainbow from a mountaintop or from an aircraft, if you're lucky enough, you'll see the rainbow in its full glory as a complete circle. So those sort of scientific explanations of something natural that we can all enjoy only add to the awe, only add to the wonder. It doesn't it doesn't mean we're all sort of cold, hard, rational Mr. Spocks. Science enriches our lives in ways that, you know, I just feel like I want to share with the world. So your comment about it being important for folks to gain some science literacy and that understanding, I agree, is super important. We elect folks to represent us and mm. they're making decisions on very complex issues, things that we have no idea they're even talking, they're even making decisions on necessarily. Um, everything from defense technology, uh, space technologies, they're deciding things. And mm. unless they understand how all that works, how do we expect these folks to make these decisions correctly? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Just like a populist, we need to improve our science literacy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in the, the UK is the same as the US, really. We don't have enough politicians and policy makers and decision makers who have a scientific background, a scientific understanding. And you're right, you know, we're living in a world where technologies are developing so fast. You know, how do we tackle the Earth's climate? What do we do with the, with the arrival of artificial intelligence? Um, you know, we can, as scientists, we can try and um, uh, explain the, the science to the wider public. But in the end, the people that we elect to make decisions, they need to appreciate what's involved. You know, artificial intelligence is a technology you can't slow down. You can't stop it. It's happening. But we need to discuss it. We need to debate the ethical implications and regulations in place. And, and without the politicians who, who, who have a scientific background, you know, we, we, we're in trouble. So I think we want more people to study science, not just to become scientists, yeah. but then to use that scientific understanding in all other walks of life. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our audience about? What's your what's your next project? What have, what have you been working on lately? Well, I'm uh, so my current research is in, in two areas. One is using quantum mechanics to explain biology. So does life know about quantum mechanics? And that's a, it's a fascinating, you know, physicists and chemists, when you learn quantum mechanics at, at university, yeah, we know the world is made of atoms and atoms behave according to the strange laws of quantum mechanics. But in biology, you know, people tend not to think about it that way. So it's, it's exploring ideas in, uh, of quantum mechanics inside living cells. But the other big, um, and it's probably going to be my, my next book, uh, a big project I'm working on is on the arrow of time, which is very much on sort of the borderline between physics and philosophy. Why do, do, does time move from past to future? It might seem obvious to people, but actually the laws of physics are all time symmetric, time reversible. So where does this arrow directionality to time actually come from fundamentally? It's a, it's a problem people have think about for thousands of years, and I'm, I'm not going to say I'm going to solve it, but uh, that's my area of research and probably the area that I'm going to start be talking about over the coming couple of years. Very exciting. Now, it, now the quantum mechanics and life, that's fascinating to me because you need to get really, really small to get down to quantum mechanical effects. Once you get a yeah. large enough ensemble of particles, things, the quantum mechanical effects wash out. That, I, I, absolutely. Yeah. So, so the work that we're doing now is, for example, in the double helix in DNA, the two strands of DNA are held together by what are called hydrogen bonds. So it's essentially a hydrogen atom, which can jump from one strand to the other. Uh, and uh, and it does that through quantum mechanics. So you are now down at the level of a single atom or a proton in this case, the nucleus of a hydrogen atom that can quantum jump from one side to the other. If it finds itself on the wrong strand of DNA, when the DNA splits, it unzips in the process of replication in all living cells. If the protons are on the wrong side, that could lead to a mutation. Uh, and so the, and a lot of uh, people have thought about this. And it, is it possible? Well, clearly, you know, if we if it was happening, we'd see it. So a lot of research we're doing now is to check how how possible is that? So we're quite sophisticated computer simulations uh, and a lot of quantum mechanics, a lot of math. And it's great fun. And it looks like, yes, you know, this will happen. 
and it, the, the hint is that life has evolved the ability to stop quantum mechanics from doing too much damage, to stabilize. That's incredibly, you know, and you think, well, how could it happen? How can quantum mechanics play a role anyway inside a, a noisy, messy, uh, complex living cell? Surely, as exactly as you say, it washes away what we call decoherence. But again, it looks like life has evolved certain tricks, making use of the quantum world, either to its advantage or to, to, to try and stop quantum mechanics doing damage. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating new field that brings together a lot of physics, chemistry, biology, computer science. It's, it's fun to be in. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's really amazing work, I have to say, to, to think about it on that level. Um, I haven't done so, but I look forward to your next book. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And hopefully we can have you come join us in person sometime. And they can bring the books back and get them signed. And get them uh, signed personally. Absolutely. I'd love to do that. It would be a lot of fun. So ne <laughs> next trip, we need to have you come to Griffith Observatory. This time, I know the timings didn't work out. We had that eclipse yeah. and it was just a little bit busy. But it has been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, so much fun to talk to somebody like-minded as myself when it comes to getting science to the public. We want it to be fun. And yet we do want them to start to see the world in a little bit more of a rational way. Um, it doesn't have to be unfun though, folks. You know, that's no, absolutely. Well, it's been fun talking to you, David. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Everybody, let's uh, give them a round of applause. Yay. <laughs> So we're extremely lucky to have with us tonight um, Paul Kerno. He is from Adelaide Planetarium in South Australia, and um, he's the longest-serving planetarium lecturer. Let me step away from the, the feedback. Um, the longest-serving planetarium lecturer in South Australia. Um, over three decades of research, he's regarded as one of the world's leading authorities in Australian Aboriginal night sky knowledge. Um, he served as a consultant for indigenous astronomy for the Australian Space Agency. Um, since 2012, he's taken on the role of lecturer for the School of Education at the University of South Australia. Uh, moreover, since 2021, he's been a member of the Andy Thomas Space Foundation Education Advisory Committee, and he appears regularly in the media, and you've authored more than 50 articles in astronomy. So we're thrilled to have um, Paul here tonight to talk about Aboriginal skies, and um, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, let's welcome Paul Kerno. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, good, all right. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Griffith Observatory for having me here. It's a great honor to be here. I've been a, a fan of Ed Krupp and the uh, observatory for many, many years. Um, and um, it's a privilege to be here. Also, I especially want to uh, thank my friends, Chris Wesley, and Jess, who have been um, looking after me uh, in the time uh, I've been here, thank you, treating me like a king uh, and uh, doing a lot for me. Um, as I said, uh, or as um, I was introduced, I've got to make sure I'm pressing the right buttons here. Uh, I'm from Adelaide in South Australia. A lot of the time when I meet people in the US, they know Sydney and Melbourne and oh, I've never heard of Adelaide. So there we are, just there. Again, I'm just looking at my buttons there. Uh, Adelaide, uh, we have eight states and territories in Australia. We're very similar in size to the continental uh, 48 states, which I'll show you an example of uh, in a moment uh, as well. Uh, any questions about this? Everyone's good? All right, please, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. All right, that's the city I come from. It's about 1.4 uh, billion, uh, sorry, billion, million people uh, now. Uh, it's often referred to as the 25-minute city because uh, it's uh, easier to get around. Yes, sir, you've got a uh, question up the back there. Um, Big voice, please. What are those domes? What are those? Uh, hang on, let me find the laser. These domes? Yeah. This is known as the Festival Theatre. That's where we have a lot of our concerts and operas and so on. So when you visit Adelaide, you can go and see a really good play there. <laughs> All right, and I hope, you, I hope you get the chance to visit Adelaide. Uh, the river through the centre there. This is the River Torrens, uh, but this is the traditional homeland of the Ghana Aboriginal people as well, and it's known as Karawitapati in their language, which basically means the Red Gum Forest River. Um, all right, so that's where I'm from. Let's move on. Here's a site, uh, just to give you an idea of scale, often I had a friend a while ago who was going to come from California and stay with me, and she said, 
I think I'm going to, you know, get a push bike and ride from Adelaide to Perth sort of thing, which is Adelaide to Perth is from there to there. All right. I said, no, you're not. That wouldn't be safe. Um, but when we look at the continental uh, 48 states, you can see that we're kind of similar in size. So often uh, we don't realise uh, the similarity. There we also have the... Um, uh, Australian flag with the Southern Cross, so we have a constellation on our flag. The Southern Cross is the smallest of the 88 modern constellations that we use today. And there's the UK for comparison there uh, as well. All right, now uh, as a non-Indigenous person, I've worked for the uh, Planetarium for about 32 years now, uh, and I've had the great uh, privilege to be able to work with uh, a lot of different Indigenous communities within uh, Australia. And it's very important um, to realise that before Europeans came to Australia en masse in 1788, there were at least uh, 300 distinct languages. And if you have 300 distinct languages, that means you can have hundreds of different ways of seeing the Southern Cross. There is no one way. So Aboriginal people aren't one large uh, homogenous group. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to impress upon you, if you live in the desert, uh, you see in the sky uh, snakes, reptiles, um, birds and, and things that you see in the desert, where if you live on the coast you'll see stingrays and sharks and marine type creatures. Incidentally, if any of you have trouble with my accent, just say, what did you just say? That's fine. I won't, I won't be insulted. Although being from Adelaide, we tend to be a little bit more English in our, our accent. We're not too bad. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, this was a picture taken by a friend of... I was sort of aiming my camera uh, up at the night sky and um, a friend of mine took a picture of me uh, taking a picture um, and it's kind of been an example used in the media a lot as an example of how uh, dark our skies are. Um, a few things we have it as an advantage. One is the earth you'll know is tilted over an angle of 23 and a half degrees. And so the southern hemisphere is actually tilted towards the centre of our galaxy. So the centre of our galaxy towards uh, Sagittarius in that region there passes right overhead and I was watching it from Fallbrook the other night and it passes right quite low on the horizon all right so and I was a bit confused at first because I don't know my northern sky really well but I was really happy that I could find Ursa Major and Cassiopeia and so on um, but you know to uh, head out of Adelaide about 90 minutes we have really dark skies so we've got that advantage the other thing is uh, in the northern hemisphere you've got uh, 6.967 billion people. Uh, in the southern hemisphere there's about a billion, just over a billion people. So, you know, there's more ocean in the south, there's more population in the north, more, uh, uh, um, uh, more land, so there are more cities. Um, and so we do have a little bit of an advantage with dark skies. And preserving dark skies is really, really important, uh, fundamentally important uh, to be able to, uh, for future generations. All right, so the constellations we use today, in particular, come from the Sumerians who lived in the area that was modern-day Iraq. And that knowledge was passed on to groups like the Phoenicians, who were mariners, and they passed their knowledge on to the ancient Greeks and the Romans, and then it's eventually come down to us. So we have a very Eurocentric view of the night sky. And so in 1922, a meeting in Rome uh, with the International Astronomical Union, so they are the governing body in astronomy, said, look, we have to ratify this, we have to make some sort of sense. So uh, the countries, mainly in Europe, got together and said, well, look, you know, in this part we call it that, and so some constellations were dropped, some were added, uh, particularly uh, later in the Southern Hemisphere, excuse me. And um, so now we, use, uh, we have 88 constellations. And that's actually an image from that meeting in Rome in uh, 1922, and it was published in 1930. Now, like my friend and colleague uh, Ed Krupp, the director here, I've always had a fascination with ethno-astronomy. And you can see it's generally the study of non-Western astronomy and it involves uh, studying the cultural and spiritual beliefs and practices of Indigenous communities uh, and how this information applies to the knowledge and interpretation of celestial um, um, objects and events. Uh, and this is really important because often encoded within uh, stories there is scientific information as well. And in Australia, we call that the dreaming. There's a word, 
uh, that we use. And most uh, Aboriginal groups within Australia have their own word. For example, uh, the Pitjantjatjara people say Jukapa. Uh, the Adyamatna would use the word Muda. So they have words in their own uh, language. So, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about the dreaming in a moment. Now, this was a map that looks quite different than the last one uh, that was designed by a guy um, in 1974. Um, and what uh, his name was Norman Tyndale, and he worked for the South Australian Museum for nearly 50 years. Uh, and incidentally, the largest collection of Australian Aboriginal artefacts is housed in the um, uh, Museum of South Australia. So if you, if you come to South Australia, drop me an email and we'll catch up. I've got cards here. Anyway, uh, but again, uh, what he was attempting to do was language map Australia. All right, so you can see, now these boundaries aren't set in stone, but they give us a rough idea of the different language areas. And so it gives us a, a totally different perspective. The other thing is when humans moved out of Africa, and there are probably three main migrations, uh, one, the one that migrated out about 75,000 years ago, we think between 50 and 65,000 years ago, uh, humans, so Homo sapiens, uh, moved into Australia. So uh, people have been in Australia for a very long time uh, indeed. You notice I've got two dates here. So the 50,000 is looking at mitochondrial DNA and dating uh, from that perspective. The 65,000 are dates that have come back by dating artworks. Now, I, I personally, I'm still a little bit sceptical with that, but it'll be interesting to see what further research is done. But it suffices to say that people have been there a very long time. When I speak to Aboriginal elders, they would say, we've always been here, all right? So, you know, there are different ways of looking at the world. Now, if you don't have a written language, how do you record knowledge? So in the early days, knowledge was passed on through oral narration, telling stories, uh, through artworks and through dancing. And you can see some examples uh, just there. And many cultures uh, continue to use this and Aboriginal Australians still uh, tell stories about this. We have some of the oldest artworks in the world. Um, you can see a few examples uh, here. These are petroglyphs. So a petroglyph is a carving uh, in the rock. They're in Chambers Gorge in uh, South Australia in the Flinders Ranges. When you come to South Australia, make sure you go to the Flinders Ranges. Beautiful area. Um, these petroglyphs uh, have been dated by some at 40,000 years old. So others, uh, again, have said, no, we think they're younger. But it suffices to say they're tens of thousands of years uh, old. Uh, pictographs are paintings. Uh, these are, this is up in the Northern Territory, up towards uh, uh, Arnhem Land. Uh, but again, we have old artworks that record uh, these things as well. Now, you know, I go investigating these things every now and then. Um, and Chambers Gorge, the temperature, now I don't know, I work in Celsius, but this day it was 47 Celsius. Who's good at converting to Fahrenheit? Uh, like 115? 115 Fahrenheit. It was hot. Yeah. So <laughs> after walking through the, uh, the gorge, I got back to my car and I could see it leaning. And I thought, oh, I've got a flat tyre. Trying to even touch the wheel nuts in that sort of temperature is horrific. I got the wheel on uh, and then um, people said to me, well, you know, uh, you've got a flat tyre there. Why didn't you put on the spare? I said, that is the spare. That's my second flat tyre. Um, so, and you don't, I was carrying a lot of water and food and so on. So, but you don't want to get stuck out there because people maybe only come along every four or five days. Um, and so I drove on that for about 70 kilometres and got to a local station. Now, a station is the same as a ranch um, and uh, eventually got home. So you have all these fun little adventures when you're an astronomer. Uh, I didn't mind, I didn't mind stand, staying out there, but my companion that was with me at the time, she wasn't impressed. She wanted to get home, which I can understand. Some of the oldest continuous spiritual beliefs and practices as well. We know this because we can look at stories about the rainbow serpent uh, and they've been uh, artworks that have been dated tens of thousands of years ago are uh, still uh, being taught. Now, this, uh, the oldest anatomically modern human cremations in the world were found at Lake Mungo um, in uh, New South Wales. Um, and again, this is an interesting place to visit. Also in this area, so the, the human remains are about, uh, dated between about 42,000 and 46,000 years. Um, the, these footprints 
were found in 2003. Uh, there are 457 footprints. Now, they look like they were done pretty recently, but those footprints are 23,000 years old. All right? Now, one of my students, one of my Aboriginal students said, I've got a photo of my foot next to one of those footprints. So you're looking at his, ancestor, his foot and his ancestor's foot separated by over 20,000 years. Because I said, oh, you've got to let me use that picture. It's a <laughs> wonderful picture uh, as an example. All right, here's a definition of the dreaming. Now, I guess uh, for, uh, from an understanding point of view, the best way to speak about this would be uh, mythology. But in Australia, they wouldn't uh, describe it as uh, mythology. So the dreaming is an ongoing process. It is an explanation of the formation of the, uh, and evolution of the cosmos and terrestrial features. So the dreaming is a blueprint for the living and contains laws and rules for all living things. So uh, I guess, you know, this was popularised. It was um, uh, invented by a guy who, uh, from Adelaide, actually, another South Australian uh, named Gillen, and it was popularised by a guy called Stanner. Um, and I guess it helps us understand uh, the way that Aboriginal people understand the cosmos. So they would talk about ancestral beings uh, forming the stars, the mountains, and the different uh, features, the topographical features on the earth. There we go, that's what I was just saying. So the ancestral beings were responsible for creating the surrounding topography and the stellar realm um, above. All right. I'm not going to dwell too long on these because I realise I'm babbling away for a long while here. The, um, so the night sky is a great cosmic storyboard. Uh, when I was a little boy, we would sit outside uh, and we would look up at the night sky and you would see, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stars. <coughs> and although my mother didn't know the sky really well, excuse me, <coughs> she did know the basics. Uh, and I was of that generation that I used to rush home from school to watch a television show called Lost in Space. Um, and so, you know, it was that age where you'd watch Lost in Space, you'd go out and look at the night sky. And so just like we were doing that in, in more recent times, uh, Aboriginal Australians could use the night sky to teach stories, as to use as a moral framework, uh, a way of reinforcing group identity. Uh, very important to understand weather patterns. So this was their clock. You needed to know when the emus were laying eggs because it was a source of food. If I get hungry now, I go to the fridge. I go to their fridge at the moment, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, it's easy. But if we were placed in the desert uh, tomorrow, um, would we survive? Native Americans have been doing it for a long while. First Nation people, Aboriginal Australians have been very successful at surviving. I'd struggle to do that. Um, so I greatly appreciate their skills in these areas. So having an understanding of the night sky was important because you'd know what plants were growing. And look, at most of Australia is a desert. It's a very dry place. We have 27 million people in a country similar in size to continental US. You guys, 331 million, something like that now. Um, but, you know, we just don't have the water out there in the desert to uh, survive in these places. Now, coming from Adelaide, uh, the traditional custodians, the traditional people of this area are the Ghana people. And uh, their name for the sun is Tindo and their name for the moon is Kakara. Uh, Kakara is a male and Tindo is a female. Now, the interesting thing in most cultures, uh, the sun is not normally female, it's normally male. Ra in ancient Egypt, uh, Helios, the sun god with the Greeks, all right, Selene with the Greeks for the moon, female. But in most Australian Aboriginal cultures, not all, that is reversed. It is the other way around. All right, and we even have a bus driving around Adelaide that is named Tindo, all right. Now, evidence of this can be seen in petroglyphs. This is a place called Nort Nort. Uh, and it is traditional homeland of the Nungaraku people. Uh, and this um, uh, sun there, all right, that petroglyph identifies uh, the women's camp, all right, because they're associated with the sun. The petroglyph I'm pointing to there, it's a little hard to see, that's a crescent moon, all right, with a spear through it there. So that identifies the men's camp. And these dots, the Nungaraku tell me, are records of uh, full moons. So the way they were uh, using their time, you'll know with the civil calendar, it's 365 and a quarter days. A lunar calendar uh, is 11 days short. 
So every, like the Egyptians, you know, after every two, three years, would just whack in another month, as you do. Simple. Um, but you end up out of sync over time. But they would do things like, I'd say, look, I want to see this gentleman. Let's meet in three full moons' time. You know, so they'd keep a record of full moons in that way. Does that make sense? No one's snoring, so that's a good sign. <laughs> doing well. Doing well. All right, here's a few different names of the moon, and this allows me to have a quick drink. All right, this is water, by the way. No one slipped tequila in here. So, Kalu, uh, Michin, um, the Aranda people come from Central Australia. The Borong are from Victoria, and I'll say a little bit more uh, later. Aranda from Central Australia. The Adyamatna are from north, uh, in the Flinders Range, north of me. Uh, Millingimbi's in the Northern Territory. Queensland, uh, that's Victoria as well. So, a few different states in there as examples. All right, now we're zooming in to the area I kind of live here. Again, there's Ad modern Adelaide. So this was the traditional range of the Ghana. Over here you've got the Nutanjeti, uh, the Peramank in the Adelaide Hills, the Nukunu, and the Narungu uh, down in this area here. Now most of these guys are very similar language. So when I mentioned earlier there were 300 distinct languages, with dialectual diversity we can expand that to 600 languages. I think in uh, the United States there's some 550 indigenous languages, uh, something like that. Uh, so very similar in, in uh, numbers. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the reason we know about um, the Ghana stuff is because two Lutheran missionaries came to the colony in 1836. That's when Adelaide was settled uh, uh, from Germany, uh, Claymore Sherman and uh, Christian Tickelman. And they wanted to convert the locals to um, Christianity. And to be able to do that, they needed to be able to say, hey, we need to understand the Ghana language. So as a consequence of recording the Ghana language, also some of the night sky knowledge was recorded as well. And this is why we now know uh, some of the uh, information. We don't know a lot, but we know bits and pieces. Now here you can see a, an image of the Milky Way uh, looking up uh, not that far from where I live, um, and when we look at an image like that from a scientific per, uh, perspective, uh, we've got about 200 billion stars in our galaxy, uh, but our eyes aren't quite sensitive enough to be able to define them into individual stars, but we still see that accumulated glow. And as I mentioned, the Ghana, see, well, I may not have mentioned, the Ghana see this as a, a river in the sky. So just like we have rivers on the land, we have rivers uh, in the sky as well. And they call this wadli pari. And a wadli is a word for a hut, like a house. And pari means river. So this means a hut river. So the bright stars are where people are camping with campfires. Uh, the river is through here. All right, so we'll move up a little bit. Now the dark patches are uh, said to be where the yura lives. And the yura was seen as a giant serpent that moved through the dark patches of the night sky. Because we have... Some, in, if you're in a dark sky, some really nice dark patches that stand out really, really well. Um, and so they would tell the children, they'd say like Wesley, don't go near those dark patches in the water because the, the yura would get you. And north, further north they call it the akura, uh, uh, a serpent. All right, does that make sense? All right. All right. Now, we also have uh, two bright objects, if you're under dark skies, called the large and the small Magellanic clouds. And they are satellite galaxies that go around our own galaxy. Now, I don't know how far towards the equator you have to be to see them, uh, but certainly they're high in the sky where I live. And if you can get away from the light pollution, they're really quite bright. So these two satellites. Now, the Large Magellanic Cloud, they're named after the Portuguese explorer uh, Ferdinand Magellan, who journeyed south in about 1519, I think it was. Um, and um, what again, you're seeing is the accumulated light from millions and millions of stars, but your eyes aren't sensitive enough to be able to define them into individual stars. There are about 10,000 million stars or so in uh, the large Magellanic Cloud. This object is uh, about a, hundred, well, a little under uh, 170,000 light years away. So if you could travel at the speed of light, uh, it would still take you around that time. In fact, in 2000 and, hang on, no, 2000 and, Seven, was it? The supernova? 
we had a supernova in the large, I forget the year, in the large Magellanic cloud. But keep in mind, even though that happened then, it's taken 170,000 years for the light to come and reach us. Um, and the speed of light is, I, I apologise, I work in kilometres, but moves at about 300,000 kilometres per second. For those that want an accurate figure, it's 299,792.458. Much easier, I think it's 186,000 miles per second. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, who'd like to have a go at pronouncing that? Wesley, do you want to have a go at pronouncing that name? You're doing pretty good, mate. Excuse me. Nyakalo Maro. And uh, so these are seen as two uh, rainbow lorikeets, these birds here. And I get these in my backyard. They're, they're a very pretty bird. They're noisy. They'll eat all your fruit, so you have to protect your fruit. Um, but the story goes that they were killed and they were placed on a fire. They were cooked. And all we see now are the two misty white patches, the ashes from these two birds. All right, now, I was out at Four Book the other night and I keep on telling these guys that Orion is upside down, but they'll tell me Orion's the right way up here. Uh, of course, you know, as you head south, things are kind of moving and this is the way we see Orion. So you know his shoulders are here, the star, uh, Betelgeuse just there, head there, belt there, all right, sword and the star Rigel there and the feet, all right. But we see it that way up, so that's right for us. Um, you'll know um, with the, and there's a lot of artistic license in some of these images, but this is the correct way up. I think this one was by Havelius, one of the Polish astronomers. The stars on the shoulders, just to compare. All right, belt, belt there, all right. In Australia, um, you know, we have constellations and we also have asterisms, which are kind of nicknames for constellations, and we call that the saucepan because it's the bottom of a saucepan there. Side, side, handle there. The Kiwis, my cousins in New Zealand or Aotearoa, uh, call it the shopping trolley. <laughs> Three years there, side, side. And it's one of those trolleys that will never go in the direction you want it to go. All right. But as you can see, um, that name is Tininyarana, which is the Ghana name. And this is a group of young men that are on the edge of that river that I showed you earlier, the Wadley Purry and they are hunting emus and kangaroos on the river. And they're going to be joined by the Seven Sisters. Who'd like to have a go at pronouncing that? Anyone? Or should I just pick on someone? Everyone's going, looking away. No. Um, that's Manka Mankarana. Uh, and the, Mankara is a word for young female in the Ghana language. Uh, and so, again, these are a group of women. <coughs> it's interesting to note that so many cultures see this as women. Uh, I notice uh, quite a few North American cultures see them as a group of boys, depending on where you are. Um, but quite often in, throughout the world, they're seen as a group of women. And the same applies in Australia uh, as well. Not all groups, but uh, many groups. Meteors or shooting stars or falling stars, uh, bits of small rock and dust, and we were kind of discussing that a little bit with asteroids and uh, things. And when they hit our atmosphere, they uh, compress the air in front of them and the air heats up and they basically melt the rock or the, the dust and we see them glowing and falling. Now, many of these have been viewed as clever medicine men uh, that are coming through the, like, kind of like shamans, uh, that are coming through the sky uh, and they'll poke you with their spear because people are sleeping outside uh, and wake you up uh, and so on. And there, again, there are uh, a number of different names you can see there from uh, a number of uh, groups. If you have questions, I'm happy to uh, answer questions during the talk. Now we've gone to the state of Victoria, and you can see there are about 34 different language areas in Victoria. Now, Victoria is an area that gets a lot more water, and this is why you've got a lot more groups uh, compiled within this uh, area. One of the areas we go to is Lake Tyrrell, um, and this is a big, the largest salt lake in this particular state. And it's interesting because the first academic paper on uh, the Aboriginal night sky was written about the Borong people. So we know a little bit more than average uh, about the Borong. Oh, I'll just go back one slide. Um, so we actually have star parties uh, out here. We get out on the road and we set up telescopes because the skies are very dark. And of course, if you have a barbecue, that gets called a starbecue, all right? So everything is 
prefixed with, um, with uh, the star. Um, but it's a great place to see the night sky. So I just want to compare. So there's Orion, the correct way up in Australia. Um, and you can see they call it Kulkumbula. Kulkumbula um, is, Kulkun is young uh, male. Bula is a suffix meaning two. Uh, and they are a group of men dancing in a corroboree. Now, I imagine, how many people know what a corroboree is? Imagine, yes, yeah, oh, an Adelaide person, that's a shock. Um, yeah, I've got another Adelaide person here. What are the odds? What are the odds? What are the odds? Uh, yes, yeah, she deserves a clap, yeah. Um, and um, so uh, a corroboree, the elders tell me, uh, is kind of like a, a, a meeting. So they get together, they exchange information, they exchange dances, song, culture. Um, and so the stars in Orion, in this case, are uh, a group of men dancing in a corroboree, all right? The bright star in Taurus, or Debron, uh, is seen as a male elder. Now, there's a little bit of a different structure in Australia where uh, they don't talk about um, tribes. We don't call them tribes in Australia. Um, some Aboriginal people may use that term, but we use the term group because the elders tell me we're not a tribe, we don't have a chief. It doesn't work that way. They have a panel of elders, so it's a little bit different in uh, structure. This is why I use uh, the term group. Uh, if we're talking about smaller subgroups, we use the term uh, clan. Does that make sense? All right, so Lan and Kuruk is the name for the Pleiades, and they are a group of uh, women, and they've got possum skins stretched across their knees, and they're drumming like that, all right? Let's move on. So this is the Borong stuff. Now, the brightest star in the night sky is Sirius, which you'll know is one of the Greek names that means scorching. Uh, incidentally, about 65% of star names are Arabic in origin. The Arabs were very good stellar cartographers, and they named things individually, and we're still using many of those names, probably pronouncing them badly. Um, but Warapil is the star Sirius, and he's seen as the... Um, wedge-tailed eagle. The wedge-tailed eagle is our largest bird of prey in Australia. Um, if you want to see something interesting, recently on uh, social media they type in uh, eagles attack attacking kangaroo. There's three, three wedge-tailed eagles trying to attack this kangaroo. It's quite interesting. They don't get the kangaroo, by the way. The, he gets away. Um, and the brightest star in Orion is his wife, Kologolarek Warapil. And the star Canopus, which is the second brightest star in the night sky, is uh, a male crow, which they pronounce, it looks like war, but they pronounce it like wah, like the crow making the noise, wah, wah, that kind of sound. Um, and crows, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a little bit of hay for Crows were very important in Australian Aboriginal culture because these were the animals that brought fire down to the earth. And you needed fire to keep warm and to cook and do all of those things. Uh, as well. The brightest star, now the Kulin people come from near Melbourne, around that area there, if you're familiar with Melbourne. And they see Sirius as a giant hunter called Loan, and Loan Tuka, the second brightest star in the sky, Canopus, is the wife of that hunter. Now the two bright stars in Gemini, Pollux and Castor, uh, they're part of the crew of the Argonauts, uh, if you're familiar with that story. They're called Wangel and Yuri, and they're also seen as two hunters in the night sky. Uh, and they are nightly hunting a kangaroo called Pada. Um, so again, you know, you could explain stories about, hey, these two guys are hunting this particular, excuse me, kangaroo. Now there's a long exposure photograph of the constellation Scorpius. It's a little hard to see because it's so long, but let me see the shape. The claws are in this area here, the body through there, the tail and the stinger on the end there. Now we know these two stars are Shawla and Lisath and the bright star there is Antares, it's a red supergiant star. It's so large that if we could take Antares away and place it to where our sun is, it would consume the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars and probably be about halfway out to Jupiter. So it's an incredibly large star. But as you can see they call the two stars in the end Karak Karak and they are a uh, uh, female and male falcon birds and Tuit is the name given to the young male. Um, corona Australis, now you, you guys would probably know Corona Borealis, a northern crown. We have a very faint southern crown uh, and that's seen as a boomerang, that shape there. 
right? And a boomerang is an instrument that was used for hunting. It could be thrown. Uh, and there are different types of boomerang through different areas. It's seen as a, um, a bird called a kookaburra as well. I'm not quite sure on the orientation uh, they see that. But kookaburras have this amazing uh, call uh, when they cry out. Now, there's Orion again. And it's kind of um, upside down to you guys. But I wanted to say, you know, here's the Seven Sisters. And so when I was out the other night, I'm looking up and thinking, oh, you know, it's kind of the different way around. But <clears throat> there's Orion again. The shield stars of Orion go through there. The head of Taurus the bull just there. And so in Australia, we have a mammal called the dingo. Uh, the dingo is kind of like a, a jackal type animal, I guess. Um, and those stars there are seen as a pack of dingoes, right? Now... The Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, are just down here, um, and they're a group of women, and these dingoes are protecting the women from the male up here. So quite often through Australia, uh, dingoes were protectors of women, and quite often the story goes that um, the women were running away from the unwanted advances of a male. All right, so sometimes the male is the moon, sometimes uh, the planet Venus, sometimes Orion, and so on. Now, a little bird we have in Australia uh, called a willy wagtail. Now, one of the elders, Bill Harney, now he's from the Waterman culture in the Northern Territory. Uh, he would tell me that this is, there's a willy wagtail, all right, with his tail up like that. And he'd say, that's the eye of the willy wagtail, the belly there, and the tail up like that. And it really does look like a willy wagtail um, when you see it. All right. The Southern Cross features prominently. Um, now, excuse me why I blow my nose, um, because it really does stand out. It's a little bit like Ursa Major here. Ursa Major is a very distinct shape, and you can see it quite easily. All right. Um, and where I come from, they see the Southern Cross as the eagle's claw. So when someone passed away, the eagle's claw would come down and... What's your name again? Sarah. Sarah, and grab poor Sarah, we don't want you to die, Sarah, um, and grab poor Sarah and carry her spirit up into the, the Vukana Awi, the Milky Way, and wash all the ochres and pollutants that she'd accumulated while living on the earth. So you can see that eagle's claw shape there. There's the Southern Cross, all right, just there, all right, and that's the eagle's claw, just there. And you can see that the Adyamatna and Nudgeri people also see it as, you know, Wildu and Wilto, same name. It's just like some people say dance, some people say dance, chance, chance. You guys say castle or castle here? Castle. Castle. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say castle. All right. So, you know, and, and in Sydney they say castle. They say school. I'd say school, you know. So we have different accents uh, in, in Australia as well. They're a little bit harder to detect though, harder to detect. So here's the example of the, the eagle's claw would come down and grab your spirit and carry it up to the Vukana Awi in the Adyamatna language um, and um, carry you through the night sky. So they have a very similar view to the, uh, the Ghana people. Now, when you go over the Adelaide Hills, the language is very different. You know, uh, you come into the lands of the Nurunjeri people and it's like comparing German and Japanese. Um, that's how different they can be. But quite often um, within groups, uh, the women were exogamous, so they would marry into another group and the women were the ones that did the translating because they'd have to learn uh, both languages. And as you can see there, the Nut and Jetty see it as a stingray. And I think it makes a way better stingray than it does a cross, personally. Here again, we've got this, uh, the stingray. Now, if you were to talk about the pointers in Australia, you'd be talking about Alpha and Beta Centauri. But here it's Merak and Dubby, is that right? Merak and Dubby? Dubby? I don't know how you pronounce it here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they point towards Polaris. Yes, right. So the, there's a northern pointers and a southern pointers. Um, and so we call them the pointers. And those two stars there are two sharks, the Narakani or Rakani, that are chasing the stingray across the sky. Oh, the other image there is a, uh, the image that the Australian Space Agency uses now. Uh, and I was the consultant on that. And so all of these represent different constellations. The yellow one represents the dark emu. That's one of the Southern Cross uh, there. So they're all different stories. Uh, another Southern Cross there. All right, now the Stingray uh, is in there. That's the Stingray there. I think it was that one uh, with the two pointers there. Anyway, they all represent, which I think is a really good thing, 
uh, connecting a, a, a very old culture with uh, modern uh, space exploration. Um, the, um, the Borong see the Southern Cross a little differently. They have a story about there was a hunter called Bunya and he lived in a time when there were giant emus uh, throughout the land. And so one day he was uh, out hunting and this giant emu came crashing through the bushes and he immediately dropped his spears and ran up to the top of a tree. And he said, I'm not coming down. Now, two brothers known as the Berm Bermgul were out for a little bit of a revenge. So they came after this giant emu and they speared the emu. And so the, the emu is this dark nebula here known as the Colsac Nebula, which stands out really well under dark skies. So the spear tips went through here. Now, there are a couple of different emus in the sky. This particular one curled up its body when it was speared and with the two spear tips there. They're the two brothers and that's Bunya the hunter up the top. So the two brothers said, it's safe, you can come down now. And he said, I'm not coming down. Uh, and so they thought he was a bit of a, a chicken. So one of them put a bit of a spell and said, you are going to remain up in the tree forever as the possum. And that's the way they explained about possums coming about. Now try and explain that to a five-year-old Australian girl. I, I was giving a lecture one time in, in Victoria and this little blonde girl was sitting at the front going <laughs> like this. And she said, that's not how possums came about. She said, evolution, possums evolved. And I said, well, yeah, that's true, but this is just a story. And I said, you know, like Little Red Riding Hood, we don't literally believe a grandma's a wolf. And she said, I've never heard of that story. <laughs> so um, try and explain it. Anyway, so, so as I said, we have dark patterns. This is a photo taken by a colleague of mine, Graham Stanley. There's the Southern Cross just there. There's the two pointer stars. And this is the head of the emu, dark laying down here, coming down like that, comes down like that, the neck and the body. And when someone points this out to you, it really does look like an emu. So an emu is a large Aussie bird. It's the second largest bird in the world uh, after the ostrich in, in Africa. There's an emu. All right. So, and we see lots of the, not in my backyard, um, but certainly if you go to the bush, the outback, you'll see lots of emus, you know, a few, few hours away from the local cities. Uh, this one's kind of an interesting one. This comes from the Galara Balu people and they call their emu um, Marala. And the interesting thing about this particular one, they have a story about Marala being able to literally walk uh, across the land to the horizon and up into the sky. Because with many Australian Aboriginal cultures, people could walk into the sky. Another common way to get to the sky was to throw spears into the sky and climb up on spears. Uh, as well. And so uh, the interesting thing with this, this particular story, is Marala left foot. So these are fossilised footprints. And so you find these prints as you walk out. And, and he, as I said, he walked up into the sky. <coughs> the only thing is, these are dinosaur footprints. And it's the only story I know where dinosaur uh, footprints have a bit of a connection to the night sky. And so these are a theropod dinosaur, so there's something similar to Dinonychus or a Velociraptor or so on. Um, yes, there's some more footprints of uh, Marala walking up in the sky. So depending on where the dark emu was, uh, meant that when it was first coming up, that's when the female emus were chasing the males to mate. And then it get a bit higher, the females laid the eggs. Um, then when it got a little bit higher, they'd know there's blood in the eggs. So you can't collect the eggs as a source of food then. Um, and then, of course, the male takes over. So if you ever see an emu with babies, it's always the male. The male looks after the, um, the, uh, the chicks when they get a little bit older. All right, how are we going for time there? Five minutes? Yeah, all right, I'm going to zip through some of these a bit quicker. Um, so the dark shape like the coal sack, which is about 400 light years away, it's been seen as a giant fish, alakitcha. Eagle's nest is a wedge-tailed eagle. All right, the spirit of death in the form of a bat. So there are, now the only people I know that do these dark patterns are Australian Aboriginals. Uh, the Incas do, uh, did dark pattern constellations. Uh, there are a couple of Maori ones from uh, New Zealand as well. But there weren't many groups. And as far as I remember, they were all in the Southern Hemisphere uh, as well. Here are a few different names for the Pleiades uh, from a couple of different groups. Atunyi, Ajamatna, Kungurunkara from the Pitanjara and Yankananjara people. The Mai Mai and Mukanyangaruk from the Wachubalak people.
But again, you can see with one exception there, with a boy in there as well, uh, they were all seen as women. Now, as I mentioned, the women were running away from the unwanted advances of uh, male. And in the case of the Adyamatna, the mountains in that area were said to be formed by giant serpents that were crawling through the valleys and moving around. And so when this male was chasing them, they thought, we'll run into a cave for safety. But what they hadn't realised was they'd run into a, uh, the mouth of an akura, a giant serpent. And so the akura swallowed them up. Now, sometime later, there was a giant flood and the, the serpent drowned. And as the serpent's body went to the bottom of the water and the body decayed, the gases built up and the body uh, started to float to the top of the water. Um, and then as the gases built up in the, the belly, it burst open and the women were flung into the sky. And this is the way they explained uh, the way they uh, came to being in the sky. As I mentioned, the Magellanic Clouds uh, have a few different names. They're seen as two lawmen uh, in the sky. And I won't go into a big explanation now because I realise I'm uh, running low on time here. Uh, they've been seen as the camp of a male and uh, a woman in the sky uh, as well. So again, many different interpretations. And we have an instrument in Australia called the Yidaki or the didgeridoo. Um, and this is a, a woodwind instrument. And so the story goes that Budabukbun, who came from Queensland, was said to have lived in a time when there were no uh, stars in the sky. And so he, he created a fire for his family and he put a log on the fire and he realised in the log there were termites and he didn't want to kill the termites. So he took the log out of the fire, held it up to his mouth and blew hard and that blew the termites into the sky and they became the stars of the Milky Way. Um, and this was the first time that the Yidiki or the didgeridoo had been heard throughout the land as well. Now, you know, some people say, well, look, is this science? Is it really astronomy? I don't research that area uh, as heavily, but my colleague who supplied this uh, photograph, Ray Norris, he looks at some of this and he's looked at stone circles in uh, one known as Wurda Yuang. And you can see this circle here. Uh, there's a row of rocks there, a row of rocks there. And if you stand in the center, this marks the setting position of the sun during the shortest day of the year, uh, setting position of the sun during the longest day of the year and the equinox, equal night and equal day. Now to me, you know, this is science. If they're making these kinds of observations, I would say that's diff definitely science. You might remember I uh, mentioned the, the dots, uh, the full moons that the, uh, they were using in, uh, at Nort Nort. Um, the Paramount people also, when they were working for, <coughs> excuse me, the first settlers, they were putting notch marks on the, the tools they were using and the settlers didn't know what was going on, but they were recording full moons and that was the way they were ageing their children, ageing themselves. So they would know how old they were. All right, so near the end. So the Aborigines have a myth connected with uh, nearly all the constellations and bright stars in the heavens. This was said by David Uniapon. Uh, David Uniapon is the gentleman you can see there on the $50 note. And he was an important uh, inventor uh, and scholar. Um, and um, he, um, they used to call him the, the Aboriginal Da Vinci uh, because he was so clever with uh, the things he did. Thank you for listening to me, everyone. Thank you.